Breaks, hello and welcome in Gaelic. And welcome indeed to City Breaks, Edinburgh, episode 6, The New Town. We have been in the last couple of episodes down in the old town, but now it's time for a little more elegance, a little more refinement. A visit to the Georgian splendours of the part of Edinburgh, built largely at the end of the 18th century and very beginnings of the 19th century. The project which saw the old tagline for Edinburgh of Old Reeky disappearing somewhat, the period when people began to refer to Edinburgh as the Athens of the North, a city of culture and beauty, rather nicely summed up by Duncan J.D. Smith in his book Only in Edinburgh, as follows. With its rectilinear plan, elegant squares and graceful sandstone terraces, the new town is considered one of the finest pieces of European town planning. So yes, today's episode then, a little history about how this all came to be, some ideas about what life was like there in those times, including a visit to the Georgian Museum, where you can find out lots about all that sort of thing, and to end the episode, a little piece on the Scottish Enlightenment, which very much centred on this place at this time, Edinburgh in the late 18th, very early 19th centuries. So, how then did it come about? I talked last week about the squalid conditions in the old town by the early 18th century, the fact that 70,000 people were crammed into a space where today only 11,000 people live, and the idea was very much coming about that really something had to be done. A report written in 1698 wrote about the, quote, bad situation of poverty and uncleanliness in Edinburgh's old town. As you can imagine, anyone with a bit of money to spend was very keen to get away and go and create a lifestyle a little more genial somewhere else. The thinking began really in the 1690s, on the back of that report perhaps. Plans were made in the 1720s. More plans were made in the 1750s. So you're getting the idea that actually it was all quite slow to take off. But in 1766, work began. A competition was launched for somebody to design a new town, and it was won by the Edinburgh architect James Craig, whose proposal was for a very orderly, grid-like pattern. There would be three main streets, Prince's Street, George Street and Queen Street. There'd be two lesser streets, Rose Street and Thistle Street. So you can hear the royal connections and the Anglo-Scottish flavour of all of this. And then there would be little streets crisscrossing at right angles, and the whole thing would be topped off with an elegant square at each end, St Andrew's Square and Charlotte Square, as they are today. Land was available because the Norloch had been drained, and it was accessible because the North Bridge had been built, connecting the old town to this new land. Sadly, it had to be built twice, the first time in 1765, after which it collapsed, a number of people were killed, and then it was rebuilt in 1769. There were really two building phases to what's known as the new town today. The first one was completed by the early 1800s. That was the part I've just described. And the second phase then was laid out after that, including places like Great King Street, with its nearby Drummond Place and Royal Circus, all completed in 1820 or so. And then in the 1830s came the Murray Estate, 12-sided Murray Place, interlinking crescents and roads with unusual shapes, ovals and octagons, all befitting the orderly new way of thinking that was the Enlightenment. The purpose, of course, was mainly to create congenial living for wealthier people who could get out of the old town, and a second strand of the thinking was based in the fact that intellectuals in Edinburgh tended to leave the city and go down to London, and it was wondered, could they put a stop to that? Could they build somewhere so lovely that people would want to stay? or maybe even return, if they'd already moved to London. So by the 1830s, there existed quite a collection of the sort of places that would attract them. Lots of legal businesses, the Edinburgh Academy had been opened to provide a classical education, boys only, I'm afraid, so there was more enlightenment to follow. The assembly rooms were built, where concerts and readings and charity balls could be held. The Theatre Royal was opened in 1769. No longer there today, but for the hundred or so years when it was open, it was very popular, attracting huge audiences. Register House was built, still today the Scottish Public Records Office, and in 1816, one of the loveliest parts 
the Prince's Street Gardens were laid out. This was all pretty popular, as evidenced by the fact that by 1830, on this land where previously there had been nobody, there were some 40,000 residents. It did have its critics. Lord Coburn, for example, thought it all a bit too uniform, and wrote of, quote, the blunder of long straight lines of street, divided to an inch by rectangular intersections, every house being an exact replica of its neighbour. There was a French visitor, one Auguste Blanqui, who thought it lacked atmosphere a bit. He wrote this. One never sees anyone at the windows of these magnificent palaces, and the doors being constantly shut could make one think it was a town recently ravaged by an epidemic. A bit soulless, he thought. But most people didn't agree. They thought it beautiful and elegant. And this attitude is rather nicely summed up by Michael Fry in his Edinburgh A History of the City. He praises the regularity and the elegance, the fact that it's so suitable for the new Enlightenment era, and then writes of, quote, an experiment in living by the light of reason, a triumph of the will over nature and history. And the glorious thing is, much of it is left and can be seen today. For me, the epitome of the elegance of the new town is Charlotte Square. So one of the two original squares planned to be at either end of the first phase of the project. Designed by Robert Adam, the most celebrated Scottish architect of his day, he was paid 200 guineas, by the way, for designing it, and building began in 1791. Unfortunately, Adam himself died the following year, so his brother James took over, and by 1800, most of the north side of the square had been built. But then there was a pause. The Napoleonic Wars were underway, people were speculating less, they were saving their money, wondering what was going to happen. So no building took place for a few years, and it wasn't until 1820 that the square was completed. One result of that is the fact that the north side, the one with Butte House on it, is built exactly to Adams' specification, whereas the other three sides, not quite. But it still forms a really elegant whole. Four lovely terraces surrounding the very pretty Charlotte Street Garden in the middle. Layout for that was agreed in 1797. Eventually the ground was levelled off and a garden with little gravel walks and shrubbery was built. It was agreed that everybody who owned a house around the square would contribute to a maintenance charge, and so the square became a communal area for the residents. The meeting place of the neighbourhood, I've seen it described as. And then later again, something which you'll certainly notice immediately when you go and visit today was put up, and that is the Albert Memorial. Prince Albert, Queen Victoria's husband, had been in Edinburgh only three months before his untimely death, and so the people of Scotland wanted to erect a memorial to him. It was financed by public subscription, designed by John Steele, put up, and eventually in 1876, on the 17th of August in fact, Queen Victoria herself came to be present at the unveiling. A speech was made to her by the Duke of, somewhere I can't pronounce, I think possibly Buccleuch, explaining that people from every county in Scotland, in fact from nearly every parish in Scotland, had contributed. This is what he said. The subscriptions to the memorial numbered very many thousands of Your Majesty's Scottish subjects, all classes of society, from the highest and the wealthiest to the lowliest and poorest, willingly combined according to their respective ability to render this memorial a monument worthy of the occasion. The unveiling must have been quite a moment because it is huge, an enormous great block with a life-size or possibly bigger figure of Albert on horseback on top of it, dominates the whole square. Clearly Charlotte Square was always going to be a prestigious and rather expensive address, somewhere only a certain sort of person could live. I saw one description of the residents as being, quote, lairds, lawyers, doctors, military men and colonial entrepreneur. Henry Coburn, Solicitor General, lived there at number 14, for example. Sir William Fetz lived there. He was Lord Provost. And here, from the guidebook to the museum, which is in the square, the Georgian Museum, is one paragraph of description just giving a flavour of the sort of people who were residents here. Number six was bought by Orlando Hart, a shoemaker, who had a house built to Adam's specifications and sold it in 1797 to Mrs Isabella Crawford, widow of a banker and Jamaica plantation owner. In 1806, it was acquired by Sir John Sinclair, 
first baronet of Ulbster in Caithness, and editor of the first statistical account of Scotland. So you get the picture. Businessmen, I'm guessing the shoemaker owned the company rather than made shoes, and he doesn't seem to have kept it very long, so perhaps that was more a business opportunity in his eyes. And people who've made their money from banking, from publishing, some of whom had questionable links to slavery. If you go and visit today, it's lovely to walk once round the square, and two buildings to look out for would be number six, which is Butte House, the official residence of the First Minister of Scotland, and number seven, the Georgian Museum, run by the National Trust of Scotland, where you can find out all about life in Georgian times, here in Edinburgh of the Enlightenment. I'm coming back to that in a minute, but first I would like to mention the square at the other end of the original new town, St Andrew's Square, begun in 1768, more elegant houses all the way round, a lovely central area. This one, unlike the one in Charlotte Square, is open to the public. So you can walk around the outside of the square and gaze at such lovely buildings as the Palladian Mansion, bought by the Royal Bank of Scotland. I have to confess I didn't make it inside there, but I've read that it has inside a glorious domed banking hall. And you can wander across the square to picnic on the benches perhaps, and admire the enormous statue of Lord Melville, a towering and very impressive edifice which had, when I saw it, a little notice next to it saying that he too is thought to have had links to slavery which are being investigated and which eventually will be better explained in a display to be set next to the statue and put it into context. So you might be wondering what one of these houses actually looked like from the inside. I found what I imagine is a description of a fairly typical one, this one was in Prince's Street, in which the accommodation was as follows. A dining room, a drawing room, seven bedrooms, a kitchen, a scullery, servants' apartments, cellars, a laundry, a stable, a coach house, and, my absolute favourite, a pigeon house. It also boasted a lead cistern with a pipe within the house the phrasing making you very aware that this was a brand new thing, the beginnings of proper sanitation at last in Edinburgh, as opposed to the chuck everything out of the window technique developed out of necessity in the old town. I can highly recommend a visit to the Georgian House, the museum, where you can really get a feeling for what life would have been like in the Edinburgh of this time. The elegant lifestyle led by the people who could afford it, some of whom were aware that these things might be coming to an end, One of the residents, Elizabeth Grant, left behind her memoirs, which give us quite a flavour. So she was born at number five Charlotte Square in 1797. Her father was a lawyer and later she lived at number 17. But she was aware that the lifestyle she enjoyed wasn't for everybody and also that it might be coming to an end. She wrote particularly of the French Revolution that, quote, the startling shake it had given to the aristocracy of all Europe had made it a fashion for all men to provide themselves with some means of earning a future livelihood should the torrent of democracy reach to other lands. So this idea that you could live off your wealth might be coming to an end. Perhaps people would all have to, horror, work for their living. She was very appreciative of her life and wrote, for example, that, quote, nothing could be pleasanter than our sociable life. Henry Coburn, who lived at number 14 for a few years, from 1813, and who after that was a frequent guest at dinner parties in the square, also left his memoirs, in which he commented that he rarely spent an evening alone. We must, of course, mention all the other people who were living here, and not enjoying quite such a standard of luxury, the staff and the servants. One house I read about had 11 staff and servants. I don't think that was particularly unusual. They worked in a strict hierarchy. You might have an idea of this if you've seen Downton Abbey, although that, of course, is from a later era. And in this particular house, they were a butler, who was a manservant to the master of the house, but also had a supervisory role over all the other servants, and a housekeeper, Ditto, one of her tasks being to keep the household accounts, pay the tradesmen, etc. And then, working under them, there would have been a cook, one or two kitchen or scullery maids some housemaids who saw to the cleaning and the linen, and, if there were children, some nursery maids. If you go to visit, you can wander around a whole selection of rooms, the most impressive, I think, being the drawing room, 
which was used for entertaining and to display the family wealth so that guests would be impressed. It was in the drawing room that you might gather with your guests before dinner and to which the ladies would return after dinner while the gentlemen stayed on at the table to smoke and drink port. A diarist from the time, quoted in the guidebook, tells us what happened next. Quote, an hour or an hour and a half after the ladies have left, the hostess sends word that tea is ready. The gentlemen then join the ladies. If you're wondering how the evening continued, this diarist tells us that too. The ladies might sing or play the piano. Possibly there would be cards or backgammon or chess. Maybe, sometimes, there'd be a little dance. The furniture pushed back to the walls, two or three musicians engaged to play, and quadrilles danced. This until nearly midnight, and a cold supper would be served as a signal that guests should be thinking about going home after that. The whole thing lit up by chandeliers containing, apparently, twelve beeswax candles, which did not come cheap. There's also a parlour, a bit more of a family room, where you can imagine people reading, writing letters, doing their needlework and embroidery. Perhaps the children of the house would be brought down from the nursery to spend an hour or two with their parents. Maybe that was the place where you entertained one or two guests to afternoon tea. The dining room was rather splendid, set up as it would have been for a dinner party, so a lovely white snowy tablecloth, plenty of crystal and silver, more chandeliers. And here, again from the guidebook, is a description of a meal that may perhaps have been taken here. Quote, Dinner consists of three courses. The first dishes are already on the table when the guests arrive, and when everybody is seated, the men servants take off the covers. There are one or two kinds of soup, fish, fowl, ham, beef, and roast mutton, and, for vegetables, cabbage, spinach, and potatoes. The soup is ladled out by the hostess, the fish and meat carved by the host, and the servants hand it round. Other dishes are dealt out by the person in front of whom they happen to be placed. To do this well, one should have some practice. The second course consists of game, fowls, pies, cheese, sweets, cakes, jam and puddings. The third course is dessert. Apples, pears, nuts, figs, dates, almonds, raisins and oranges are all left on the table in great profusion until the end of dinner. When you go and visit the bedchambers, you will find four poster beds, you'll find a washstand and a bidet, a reminder that there were no bathrooms, and you may find that one of the cupboard doors has been left open so that you can see the chamber pots which were stored there. So yes, no actual bathroom, but there was a, quote, portable water closet, which you can see today and which was placed between the dining room and the bedchamber. It dates from around 1805, and consists of a large wooden bench-stroke chair with a hole in it that you can sit on, and a copper basin underneath. There was a brass handle to operate a flush. You had to hand-fill it with water, but that would empty everything into the basin, which, of course, would be emptied in due course by the housemaid. All of those the grand rooms in which the family lived, and down in the basement, the kitchen, and possibly the servants' quarters. Here's a description again from the guidebook, of the kitchen. The room was the hub of the basement, hot, smoky and a constant hive of activity. During restoration work, evidence of no fewer than four ovens was found, including an open fire range and a separate baking oven. The range, the focal point of the area, was used for all boiling, roasting and grilling. And it goes on to describe the twenty or so gleaming copper pans, all of different sizes, which were very heavy, so you can imagine the cook and the kitchen maid struggling to lift them and carry them around. And other things to see down here on the table include the sugar cones, made of raw sugar imported from the West Indies, which would sit on the table so that people could cut pieces off it using special sugar cutters which were kept on the dresser, and then grind it into tiny little pieces in a pestle and mortar. There is a china closet, which was kept locked because the family's precious china was inside, so the key to that would be held by the lady of the house, or possibly the housekeeper, and also locked away supplies of tea, also very expensive, and something which could not be left out, for fear that someone would take it and sell it on. So the Georgian Museum does leave you with a picture of society at both ends of the scale, and how it was lived in these times, 
And the backdrop to all of this is the Enlightenment. The Scottish Enlightenment, particularly, was very much a thing. And it's centred on Edinburgh. It's centred, of course, particularly on the people who lived in the new town. When wondering how it came about, I've seen explanations about political stability in Scotland after the Jacobite Rebellion had been quashed in 1745. Scotland and the city of Edinburgh settled down a bit. They had a more settled relationship with the monarchy, who in fact patronised a number of artists and thinkers. And all of that brings us to the point in the later 18th century where Edinburgh really was becoming a bit of a hub for thinkers. One of whom, one William Smelly, wrote about it, explaining how he met a friend in Edinburgh one day, who, as he put it, surprised him with a curious remark. Quote, There is not a city in Europe, said he, that enjoys such a singular and such a noble privilege. I asked, what is that privilege? He replied, here I stand at what is called the Cross of Edinburgh, and can in a few minutes take fifty men of genius and learning by the hand. Edinburgh, he went on to explain, was important enough to attract these intellectuals, but small enough to mean that they could all meet each other, discuss and debate. The Enlightenment, of course, was a Europe-wide movement, with a nod back to ancient Greece and Rome, and an emphasis on rational philosophy. But, as one author put it, it had its own particular vigour in Scotland, with towering figures such as the philosopher and historian David Hume, the political economist Adam Smith, the pioneering sociologist Adam Ferguson, scientists too such as William Cullen, the physicist and pioneer in medical research, James Hutton who founded modern geology, Joseph Black, a distinguished chemist, William Robertson, the founder of modern historiography, and a whole host of artists and writers, Henry Rayburn, Alexander Naismith, Walter Scott, and of course not forgetting the architect Robert Adam, designer, yes, of Charlotte Square, but also of such buildings as the University of Edinburgh. A lot of the discussions played out in Enlightenment societies, such as the Select Society, founded by a group of prominent Edinburgh intellectuals who had as their aim, quote, the pursuit of philosophical inquiry and the improvement of the members in the art of speaking. There was also the Royal Society of Edinburgh, devoted to all sorts of intellectual activities, medicine, for example, and theology, and something called the Wernian Society, focused on science and natural history. Many of these are listed in Christopher McNabb's book, A History of Edinburgh, and he summarises the situation by saying that they all, quote, helped to put Edinburgh on the intellectual map of Europe. Publications were important, most notably the Edinburgh Review, launched in 1802 and described by Michael Fry in his Edinburgh, A History of the City, as, quote, lengthy, weighty articles on the great issues of the day and short, sharp critiques of books just out. The editor, Francis Jeffrey, professed a dislike of the old Scots tongue, and whatever you think about that culturally, it probably did help the ideas to spread down to England and further out to Europe. And such was its renown that copycat publications began to spring up in other countries. It was, says Michael Fry, quote, in effect, the ancestor of modern serious journalism, clever, probing, irreverent. Alongside the Edinburgh Review, there's also Edinburgh University, run for three decades from 1762 by the much-renowned Reverend William Robertson, who, Michael Fry again, quote, turned it into the powerhouse of the Scottish Enlightenment, and indeed into the best seat of learning in Europe, a status it sustained until the rise of the German universities in the 19th century. I do wonder if Michael Fry is slightly overlooking Oxford and Cambridge, but nevertheless it gives a sense of how important Edinburgh University was. And just as a flavour of some of what was going on, a little more detail about David Hume, born into a deeply religious Calvinistic family in the early 18th century, so clever that he went to the University of Edinburgh aged 11, and who, by the time he was 30, had already published his Treatise of Human Nature, which didn't sell all that well, but which did get the whole of Europe talking. Its rationalist, anti-religious philosophy was quite new. It is because of these ideas that the powers that were decided they objected very much to the idea of him being Chair of Moral Philosophy at Edinburgh University, but he went on to do lots of other interesting things, embassy postings in Vienna and Turin, for example, 
and writing a number of other very controversial works which are still read and studied today. Inquiry Concerning Human Understanding, for example. Inquiry Concerning the Principles of Morals and The Natural History of Religion. And a quick mention also to Adam Smith, also much talked about today. He wrote a number of books on ethics and jurisprudence and rhetoric. And Christopher McNabb, author of The History of Edinburgh, explains what it is that makes him most famous. Quote, One work in particular stands out above all the rest, an inquiry into the nature and causes of the wealth of nations, which Smith published in London in 1776. This work provided not only the theoretical framework of modern economics and defined concepts such as the free market and the division of labour, but also had a direct impact on the way Western governments have controlled fiscal policy. I very much enjoyed reading a little extract from an autobiography written by one Mrs. Eliza Fletcher, wife of Archibald Fletcher, a reformer and advocate, who has left us a description of the sort of supper parties and evening events linked to the Enlightenment which took place in Edinburgh. Now that thinking and ideas were important, people began to give up large dinner parties and supper parties and put the emphasis more on something called evening parties, where there would be fewer people playing cards, for example, and more people listening, discussing, debating, enjoying the pleasures of music and conversation. She describes one as follows. The company met at nine and parted at twelve o'clock. Tea and coffee were handed about at nine, and the guests sat down to some light cold refreshments later on in the evening. People did not in these parties meet to eat, but to talk and listen. There you would see a group, chiefly of ladies, listening to the brilliant talk of Mr. Geoffrey. In a different part of the room, perhaps another circle, amongst whom were pale-faced, reverential-looking students, lending their ears to the playful, imaginative discussions of Dr. Brown, while Professor Playfair would sometimes throw in an ingenious or quiet remark that gave fresh animation to the discourse. So, as you'll be picking up, this was largely men, except the women did the listening, but two women do get a mention although I'm afraid it is for their qualities as hostesses rather than intellectual participants. Mrs. Fletcher describes them like this. Mrs. Apreece and Mrs. Waddington divided the admiration of the Edinburgh circles between them, the one attractive by the vivacity of her conversation, the other by her remarkable beauty and the grace of her manners. And to summarise, I think all of this is describing Edinburgh in its most influential era. Europe and America knew all about Edinburgh and her thinkers and writers. The city was now on a world map in a way that previously it never had been. In Michael Fry's book I found a hint of how possibly this came to an end eventually because he writes about Thomas Carlyle who left the city and went south to London in 1834. He was, writes Michael Fry, the first man of genius to decide that Scotland was too small and that as a bright spirit of the next age only London would do for him. But let's not give him the last word. Let's remember all the marvellous things that were achieved in Edinburgh during this very vibrant period, in this lovely, elegant, refined centre of thinking, Edinburgh's new town, Enlightenment Edinburgh. Turning my thoughts to next week's episode, that's going to be called Edinburgh's Parliament. I'm going to have a good look at Holyrood today, but also at its predecessors, the other buildings where Edinburgh's Parliament sat over the centuries, where so much of its history played out, and where that question was forever being asked and answered, who ruled or rules Scotland? I hope that you'll be able to join me for that, and so it just remains to finish today's episode by saying thank you very much for listening, and goodbye, which, as you will know if you've listened to previous episodes on Edinburgh, I have attempted to learn in Gaelic. So thank you and goodbye with apologies for any mangling of the pronunciation. The mysteries of Gaelic spelling are really quite something, but here goes. Tarpa leave, agus marshin leave. 